Electricity became commercially available in the late 1800s. Falling water or steam power turned machinery that generated direct current. In 1884, the steam turbine was invented, which is pretty much the same way that coal, gas, and nuclear power stations generate electricity today. Today, coal and natural gas are the most common fossil fuels used to produce electricity. Hydro and nuclear are the most common carbon-free fuels. These familiar conventional fuels produce their maximum output at a steady rate. Look closely and you'll see that oil produces only 1% of America's electricity and wind and solar, along with all the other alternatives combined, contribute only 3%. Because neither wind nor solar fuel can produce controlled amounts of electricity on demand, and are at Mother Nature's whim, these alternatives must be backed by a more reliable conventional source, most often powered by a fossil fuel. A wind turbine can start producing a trickle of electricity at wind speeds of 9 miles per hour, but winds must reach 33 miles per hour before it produces at its maximum possible output, known as its rated capacity. Wind speeds above 56 miles per hour are too high, and the turbine must cut out to prevent damaging itself. If too much wind puts turbines in danger, the undependable nature of the wind is also a mighty inconvenience. For every drop in wind speed by half, the electricity produced by a wind turbine is reduced eight times. Wind power unnecessarily complicates the business of creating electricity. For supply to meet the demand, wind variability must always be balanced by reliably flexible conventional generation that can start and stop on demand. Those are most often powered by fossil fuels. Wind-fueled electricity is very costly to produce, both in expensive equipment and in land area. To generate the same amount of electricity produced by a conventional coal power station, a wind plant would have to cover seven times more land. To equal a nuclear plant, a wind plant would take 30 times more. To put it in numbers, to equal the output of a nuclear generating plant, it would take more than 2,500 skyscraper-sized wind turbines spread over 500 miles of mountain ridges, plus a handful of natural gas units and hundreds of miles of new transmission lines to come close to the capacity of one 1,500-megawatt nuclear facility. If wind-fueled electricity is only available when the weather permits and is less efficient and more expensive than conventional generation, why are wind farms being built? There are two answers to that question. To answer the first, let's talk about climate change. Recent studies say that the Earth's climate is warming and that melting glaciers and the thawing water held in the polar ice caps will cause the seas to rise and flood low-lying areas. Humans may be displaced and more species of animals might become extinct, like this polar bear. Scientists blame this warming on what they call the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases, mostly water vapor, trap warm air and act like the glass ceiling of a greenhouse. Water vapor makes up about 95% of greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide is also a greenhouse gas, which is naturally occurring but also can be produced by man. We humans release around 30 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the earth and sky annually. And although carbon dioxide makes up less than 4% of greenhouse gases, our CO2 contribution is more than the natural processes can manage. Even with the small effect we have on climate change, we should probably be more concerned with the earth's environment. To do that, we have to make rational choices based on facts. 
by themselves, wind turbines don't generate CO2 when they make electricity, but that doesn't mean they're Earth-friendly. In the nacelle of every turbine, that big box that sits atop the tall tower, is over 700 pounds of neodymium, a rare earth mineral. Virtually all neodymium used today is strip-mined in China without environmental regulation. Consider that cement, a major component of the massive concrete bases, which keep turbine towers from toppling over, is the third largest producer of man-made CO2. It would take from one to three years of successful operation for a wind plant to offset the CO2 produced in just making those concrete bases. Conventional large coal and nuclear plants can't stop when the wind begins to blow and start up again the moment it stops. Because the wind is unreliable, a backup is required to keep your lights on when the breeze quits. This backup is usually in the form of a CO2 producing fossil fuel like gas or coal. The fluctuating nature of wind is also destabilizing to our electric grid. When a coal generator is ramped down to accommodate the fluctuating electrical production of a wind plant, more CO2 can be emitted rather than less. Even cleaner fossil fuels like natural gas would burn less efficiently working with wind and, in the process, weaken much, if not all, of any CO2 offsets wind could achieve. The so-called smart grid would require many miles of dedicated transmission lines to integrate wind unpredictability. But even the smart grid would not be effective in making wind a replacement for fossil fuel plants. So, wind-fueled electricity does not help reduce greenhouse gases like CO2 and is not a functional source of alternative energy. Looks like our polar bears will have to swim on and look for help elsewhere. Okay, if wind-fueled electricity doesn't have an effect on climate change, what's the other reason for building wind plants? The deal is too good to pass up. The federal and some state governments are anxious to change America's way of generating and distributing electricity. Some say it's to reduce our use of foreign oil. But they never mention that the foreign country we import the most foreign oil from is Canada. Not to mention that wind power does not create oil. Some would like us to believe that it's unpatriotic to oppose industrial-scale wind development. But, right or wrong, the government is backing wind-fueled electricity in a big way. In order to accomplish that, they're giving incentives to alternative energy producers to help them create what's called green energy. In reality, green electricity is no different in color from regular electricity. Alternative energy is expensive to produce and virtually untried in this country. The most developed form of alternative energy at this time is wind power, which, as I said before, produces about 1% of the electricity used nationwide. Through a system of financial manipulation that is unavailable to you and me, super-fast depreciation of construction costs coupled with reduced taxes and outright monetary gifts from the government have made wind plant construction a desirable investment at your expense if you're a taxpayer. This is how it goes. A wind turbine costs roughly $3 million to put up. A 100-megawatt wind plant with 40 huge turbines might cost around $350 million. Now that would be a lot of money to spend if you had to make it back by generating electricity over the 20-year lifespan of a turbine. But the government allows the wind developer to balance that $350 million in five years using double declining balance accelerated depreciation and so break even. And if the developer actually generated electricity, he would also be eligible for a wind production tax credit. Or, if you did not generate electricity, you could get an investment tax credit. Or a cash grant from the U.S. Treasury in lieu of the investment tax credit. Now, if this sounds like a deal, just wait, there's more. Wind developers also benefit from the relaxation of restrictions on tax breaks and subsidies, and Department of Energy loans, and, at the state level, state tax breaks. All in the name of green energy and jobs. Just a word about jobs. Yes, wind-fueled electricity does create jobs. 
After all, someone somewhere has to manufacture those machines, and a company somewhere else in the world has to manage them. And someone has to watch the property and lock the gate after everybody goes back to where they came from. 65% of the wind installations in the United States in the past five years have come from foreign sources, including China. The investigative reporting workshop has estimated that 80% of U.S. stimulus grant money is going to foreign firms and foreign workers. Here's one of those pictures that says a thousand words. Now, this photograph is of the ship Marinus Green on the Columbia River in Oregon. On the deck, you can see 72 steel tower sections made in Baria Van Gouda province in Vietnam. They were made for Vestas, a Danish company who provided wind turbines for Horizon EDPR, a Portuguese company that's building the Meadow Lake Wind Farm in Indiana. 2.2 billion stimulus dollars have been spent so far. 1.9 billion of that has gone to wind power. Let's recap. Wind power creates expensive electricity, subsidized by federal and state tax breaks and grants. It isn't a reliable source of utility-grade power, doesn't reduce greenhouse gases, and takes seven times as much land as coal and 30 times as much as nuclear. And if that weren't bad enough, wind power sends our stimulus dollars overseas. If electricity fueled by the wind seems foreign to you, you just might be correct.